Good morning. So my name is Michelle Spencer. I am the Associate Director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, and I am so thrilled that each of you are here with us today. I'll chat just for a brief moment about a few housekeeping items. So to the back on the right, you'll find the ladies' rooms through that door, and you make a left. The back to your left, you exit and make an immediate left, you'll find the men's room. Lunch and breakfast will be served between these two walls here, and so at any time, please feel free to help yourself to breakfast, and then certainly later to the lunch that we'll have prepared for you. In your folders, you will see that there is a blue um, flyer about the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. That flyer specifically talks about the fellowship opportunities that's available through the initiative. And so you'll hear a little bit about that in just a few more moments. We want you to think about individuals working in your organizations or outside your organizations that will be wonderful candidates to earn a, a scholarship here at the Hopkins School of Public Health in any one of our five focus areas. And certainly we're focusing on violence today. And so if there's an individual in your organization and you're willing to support their application, we encourage you to do so. And certainly more information can be found online um, under Bloomberg American Health Initiative. Finally, on your agendas, you'll see that there's a notation that says follow us on Twitter at American Health, and so we encourage you to do that. So as many of you, not many, all of you know, violence has become the fabric of our everyday lives. We see an increasing number of violent crimes, including homicides, sexual assaults, gender-based assaults, and suicides. Violence has resulted in billions of dollars in lost productivity. It has caused fractured and increasingly stressed and trauma-exposed communities. Today, we are challenged to have robust discussions that leaves us with a charge that requires active engagement. Each of you were specifically chosen to be in this space today. You were chosen with the express purpose of helping us to identify the research, the education, and the practice priorities that are relevant and impactful to addressing violence across our nation. Today, we will be informed by the experts, by all of you, by the data, the evidence, and the innovations. This day is full of promise and opportunities, and we're honored that you have accepted our invitation. This day will also challenge us to stay on time and so I ask you that you do not ignore the timekeeper and the big, large neon signs. So now, it is my great, great privilege to introduce our faculty leaders for the violence focus area of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. And I'll pause for 30 seconds just to recognize the director of the, Ameri of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, Dr. Josh Sharpstein, and the dean of practice and training. I'm not sure where he went. Oh, thank you. So, our, co our faculty co-leads. Dr. Daniel Webster is the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence and Research and co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. He leads the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg Collaboratives for Violence Reduction and holds a joint appointment as professor in the School of Education's Division of Public Safety Leadership here at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Webster is one of the nation's leading experts on firearm policy and the prevention of gun violence violence. He is co-editor and contributor of Reducing Gun Violence in America, Informing Policy with Evidence and Analysis. He has published numerous articles on firearm policy, the prevention of gun violence, intimate partner violence, and youth violence prevention. He has studied the effects of a, of a variety of violence prevention interventions, including firearm and alcohol policies, policing strategies, street outreach and conflict mediation, and school-based curricular. Dr. Webster teaches understanding and preventing violence and graduate seminars in the injury research and policy pr program. Dr. Webster. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and 
thank you for coming. I know some of, some of you came from very far, gave us a lot of your uh, time today. We'll try to make the best use of it. Uh, we selected you because we knew that you were the kind of people who could really contribute uh, to help us make our initiative successful, but also to further our common goals. We're all in this room because we care deeply and are committed to reducing violence. Um, I, I also uh, want to uh, introduce the co-chair of our work group. So the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, uh, we, we tackle five health problems. Violence is the most important of those. Um, no, they're all, they're all equally important. Um, but I'm so pleased that I have a co-lead in this very challenging task of uh, Holly Wilcox. Holly is an associate professor here in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Department of Mental Health. She's an expert on suicide prevention. And I'm going to uh, just welcome her to, to say a few words. And then we're going to have start our panel. We're going to talk about public health frameworks for guiding how we're thinking and acting to uh, reduce violence and suicide. Holly. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to have you all here from all corners of the United States. Um, today we have a, a task that I, I think will be somewhat challenging because we're focusing on three different broad domains of violence um, that are somewhat siloed in that they have different funders and different advocacy uh, groups. And however, there are so many commonalities and there's some differences. A lot of the ideological factors and pathways are similar in terms of you know, some of the things we talked about last night, the dinner trauma, aggression, family um, mental health concerns, uh, juvenile justice involvement, and, and discrimination, um, stigma, and so forth. Um, also, there's a lot of commonalities in terms of contact with the same types of service systems and windows of opportunity for us um, to use policy and, and prevention programming to make a real impact across these multiple siloed domains of violence. Um, so just to give you an idea for the agenda that you all have in your blue folder, um, the morning is going to focus a lot on talking about the evidence base in these specific areas of violence, um, frameworks, innovations. Um, and the afternoon will focus, will change just a little bit, where there will be more attention to service systems and opportunities and challenges within service systems. So that being said, I am going to, why don't we just start off with our first panel, uh, which is on frameworks. And I will introduce um, Michelle, who, who is also a member. Michelle Decker is also part of our panel. So I'll quickly introduce her now, and then we'll get started with Daniel. But Michelle is an associate professor in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at the Johns Hopkins School. Bloomberg School of Public Health. She directs the Women's Health and Rights Program of the Center of Public Health and Human Rights. She's a social, social epidemiologist. And Michelle Daniel and I will kick off this first session trying to give an overview of these domains of violence and frameworks. All right. So. This probably should have been, um, oh, somebody can. Here we go. All right. Sorry. So, um, as Holly indicated, there, there's going to be some overlaps. We're putting together frameworks, public health frameworks for addressing community uh, gender-based violence as well as suicide, um, being uh, that they have many common risk factors and common systems. 
we're going to have some similarities, but perhaps some differences. Our exercise, really, what we're hoping to do, and, and I probably should have stated um, uh, uh, initially, is that our goal here is we um, we're really trying to chart a path forward. Um, and there will be specific products, like a journal article that we'll be drafting, um, that will include these frameworks. And um, so this is a work in progress, basically. And um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and start with um, just a, a sense of the burden of violence in the United States. Um, there are different ways to measure violence. We do it through um, surveys in a National Crime Victimization Survey. We can do it through uh, death certificates and, and uh, police reports, as well as hospital care. Uh, but nearly six million uh, criminal victimizations, violent uh, victimizations in 2016, almost 1.6 million um, times uh, individuals treated in emergency departments, and uh, 17,000, over 17,000 homicides in 2016 as measured by the FBI. Um, so an, an enormous burden. Um, this, is a, this is a US focused initiative. Um, I want to just point out what perhaps most of us understand, which is the United States is a real outlier with respect to our levels of lethal violence. Uh, work by David Hemingway has showed us that our non-lethal violence is relatively within the norm of other high-income countries, but we really uh, stand out with a six-fold different uh, rate of homicide and uh, more than a 20-fold different um, uh, in, in our farm homicide rates. Um, to get some sense of uh, the basic descriptive epidemiology, um, I had another slide that I just excluded, but I'll just tell you that this is a very much, le on the lethal end of uh, the violent spectrum, it's very much a male phenomenon. 80% of victims are males, and 90% of those who are charged with murder are males. Among males, it's also quite um, uh, pronounced difference by age that's evident in this graph. And that really should really guide our efforts and our thinking when we're thinking about prevention, how dramatically things change during adolescence and young, young adulthood. And this, of course, is particularly uh, the case and more pronounced and uh, where our disparities are is long racial lines with, um, with African-American males, young males experiencing uh, extraordinarily high rates of homicide. If you're going to try to prevent it, you've got to know something about its circumstances. Sadly, our data stink. <laughs> this is a slide uh, that comes from the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, where police uh, record what, what was the motive or, or circumstance surrounding the homicide. Well, the main thing I want you to train your eyes on is that 40% number. 40% is unknown. These are cases that are not solved, and I would argue that they're actually probably the most important kinds of cases to understand. Because when homicides are not solved, they are more contagious. We'll talk about that uh, uh, as well. But right now, it appears from the FBI data that gangs and drugs aren't particularly important, uh, and that it's mostly just arguments. Arguments clearly are important, but um, when it's harder to arrest uh, for uh, drug and uh, gang-related things, um, you get a very skewed picture. Um, the demographic information is interesting, but really uh, you have to look at this uh, by neighborhood. Uh, th these, are, uh, these dots, black dots on their maps, are homicides in Baltimore City. Um, along neighborhood lines. And, and you'll see, of course, a great um, disparity. Uh, we have wide areas of Baltimore where virtually no one is murdered, and we have very small areas in which it occurs all too regularly. There's far more sophisticated statistical analysis you can do to understand the, the place relationships with 
deadly violence. But just on a basic correlation, if you want to just sort of know what correlates with high, extremely high homicide rates, um, it's a constellation of what sociologists refer to as concentrated social and economic disadvantage. Um, and in that environment where employment opportunities are low, drug um, and underground economies flourish, and um, participation in a uh, workforce is low. These data come from uh, Jonathan Gross from our health department. Um, I showed you the slide of what, look, what the police reports look like uh, of sort of the set of circumstances. This is another important snapshot. Uh, these come from data collected from violence interrupters here in our city in Baltimore. Uh, individuals who are working in the most dangerous neighborhoods with the most dangerous people trying to interrupt that violence. And to give you a flavor of what they are, are mediating the kind of conflicts, they have a lot to do with gangs, nearly 60%. And if you combine the uh, drug and robbery theft uh, component, that's also a, f a hefty share. The reason I combine that is it's it's, in my mind, connected to something we cannot lose sight of, which is basically so much of this goes on in uh, great economic uh, insecurity. Um, so uh, a lot of the violence stems directly or indirectly connected to that economic insecurities. Uh, David Kennedy gave a talk of, uh, um, at our dinner last night and made the very important point that both criminologists and public health people recognize and is really important in understanding prevention. And that is that even within the areas with the very concentrated violence, there are a subset of individuals who are very important and their risk really have to do with their social relationships, not just their social relationships, but the relationships with people, in essence, that they do bad things with, so-called co-offending. And police are using this kind of information to really target their uh, resources. We're actually going to hear about that a little bit more uh, from work in Chicago later this morning. Um, but public health individuals, I think, have to use the same kind of information. We're doing it in a much more informal way through our uh, uh, street outreach and violence interruption, but understanding these networks and how individuals are related to one another. And what Andy Pap Christos has found is that um, when one person in these networks gets shot or does a shooting, the risk for everybody else goes up astronomically. And there's an there's a opportunity and need to intervene. And, and that's part of what public health does, is we respond to things, epidemics, that we, if we don't respond to, they get out of control. And that's precisely what much of at least gun violence prevention is about. The way this um, initiative is structured, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, I think is very consistent with what I think of a very broad uh, public health framework. A pu public health framework specifically for achieving population level impacts. Um, we have formed work groups not only around the particular five problem areas, but also three other areas that are key to our, us being successful. One is a, a work group, um, I may not get the uh, label correct, but I evidence. It's basically strong research that's gonna guide our efforts. We also have a work group that is focused specifically on equity and justice issues. So if we're gonna have population impact, um, we, um, we're gonna have to do it with good evidence and always we're guided by justice. And those programs and policies have to be more than good ideas, they have to be implemented well to change systems in order to reduce violence. This is a very busy slide and I, I won't go through every component on it, but it's something common to folks in public health, where we understand the certain levels uh, of social forces at play that affect violence, among many other things that we care about in public health. There's the societal factors that shape what our communities look like, that influence what our families and peer relationships are like, 
and ultimately how it affects individuals and their personal risks for involvement in violence, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. Uh, our understanding of these different levels helps us as public health people. It's, it's, it's why I love being part of public health, actually, and, and in this school of public health, because we really do and think and operate on each of these levels. If we're going to uh, address the broader societal issues, we're going to have to be working on the structural and policy issues that ultimately are going to have to matter at a community <laughs> level that bring constellations of risk factors into communities and to, to family and peer relationships and, and uh, ultimately in how it affects individuals. So they're, they're, uh, the, this will guide us both in how we think about causes, but more, just as important or more importantly is what strategies we can employ in public health. As long as I've been doing uh, violence prevention, I've been very influenced by some early work of a psychologist named Terry Moffitt that I think is important and, and, and brings home a few important things for public health frames. She studied uh, cohorts of youth um, and found that um, as far as antisocial behavior, including aggression and violence, that some things become normative, more of the uh, less serious variety, typically. But of what is greatest concern is what she labeled life course persistent, affecting a very small subset of individuals. These individuals often have some neurocognitive uh, 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 deficits that are actually very connected to public health conditions in terms of exposure to environmental lead and other toxins, kind of nutrition that uh, uh, children get uh, when they're young. And we have the opportunity and, and really the need to address those early needs of children and the families that, are, that have those constellations of challenges if we're going to have impact in public health. Um, I teach a course, Understanding and Preventing Violence, where we talk about applying public health approaches. And what I underscore is that there is no one public health approach. There are multiple complementary approaches that I think we'll need. Part of it, part of in public health, we're focusing on what I was just referring to, is this early healthy development. And uh, our school has done so many amazing things in that domain. I think Holly's going to maybe mention a little bit of that as well. Um, in the short term, uh, in, uh, we have to focus on behavior change. But a lot of our success also is, is create, in public health is created by changing environments. How do we make uh, environments so that uh, it, they are resistant, in essence, to violent behavior, particularly the most um, severe forms of it? So there are different ways that we can change the environment. I just wanted to show this one uh, quick data slide from a study from Charlie Brannis uh, looking at uh, something that we see in our neighborhood uh, in Baltimore all the time, which is vacant dwellings, highly correlated with, uh, uh, with gun violence. They did a randomized trial in which they basically changed the look and appearance and security of those vacant dwellings and found a 39% reduction in gun violence. So changing environments uh, has uh, the potential to affect um, uh, violence in pretty profound ways with relatively modest investments. Getting back to these complementary uh, public health approaches and frameworks, we've, uh, I come from an injury background. Focusing on the agent, guns, is going to be part of the way we'll, we'll address this. We've had enormous success in infectious disease control. We know that gun violence operates very much in a contagious process. And so much of our, our focus is uh, directed at um, addressing potential outbreaks and, um, and, and using some of those approaches. We're going to talk today uh, later about underground economies, uh, principally with drugs but there's an underground economy with guns as well. And um, within that, within public health, we have adopted harm reduction strategies. We mostly think about it on the substance abuse, but we, there's also opportunities in much of what happens in street outreach 
really is harm reduction around illegal drug uh, markets and other underground economies. Um, one thing that I th think our domestic work on violence prevention really needs to learn from our international work in public health uh, is the success of changing people's e economic uh, opportunities in very concrete ways with skills and opportunities and resources for them to be successful. So that's another opportunity to apply public health approaches to have big impact. Last point I'll make is that I have always viewed public health as um, driven by policy, which of course is influenced by politics. And if we in public health are going to be successful, we need, need to learn how to advocate for the things that will make us safer, that are based on um, and also create just outcomes. Last point. Um, effective management is also something we cannot lose sight of. Uh, we see many effective uh, things uh, that look effective when uh, everything's running great and there's a, a, a randomized trial, and then um, when you go to scale, it breaks down. So, so achieving those uh, well-managed uh, uh, outcomes will be key. Final thing is funding. Thinking about how are we going to um, create funding streams and uh, that really uh, are appropriate for the returns on investment that violence prevention brings because violence costs our society enormously. So I think my time is up. I'm going to hand the baton now to... Um, I think Michelle, are you up? Yeah, Michelle Decker is going to take us through her take of public health frameworks on uh, gender-based and sexual violence. Michelle. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with so many great thinkers in all of these spaces. and. Um, while this is getting loaded, um, I really do, um, I'm going to share some frameworks and some data to get us thinking around issues that are specific to interpersonal violence in the forms of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, um, and really thinking about the ways in which we need a gender lens to think about how we're going to inform our frameworks and our evidence-based responses um, to these issues. Um, thank you. Super. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Great. So really putting, uh, let's, I'll, I'll give us a moment to really think through where and how gender can fit into our agenda, and then we'll really think about the ways in which some of our responses to gender-based violence are shared and where they're distinct when we think about self-directed violence as well as some of the gun, other broader issues of gun violence that we're talking about. So I just offer um, first this definition of gender-based violence, which is updated now um, with the US uh, State Department, um, updated from a, a 1990s definition. We're really talking about violence that's directed at people based on their per, um, biological sex, gender identity, perceived adherence to socially defined norms of masculinity and uh, femininity. So we're again really bringing this gender lens into the picture, whether we're talking about violence against women or against men. Um, and we wanna think this through when we're talking about sexual violence as well as intimate partner violence. Um, and as, as Daniel alluded in terms of the justice issues and the equity issues here, especially when we talk about partner violence, sexual violence, this is where we're looking at, in particular at some of the structural inequities between men and women, the use and abuse of physical, emotional, financial, social power and control. We've really seen this play out in the national media um, of late and so this is a, an important theme for this, for this aspect of violence. Uh, when we think about frameworks, we can think about some of the violence that we see reported to our police departments, reported on the National Crime Victimization Survey as sort of a tip of an iceberg that's reflecting all kinds of social conditions, um, family structural issues as well. And one of the 
one of the things that we see, and we've again seen this in the media so profoundly recently, is simply just a minimization of abuse um, and really gendered constraints on voice, on social and political power, on agency. These are some of the equity and justice issues that inform our understanding and therefore our response to intimate partner violence, to sexual violence, and also play out when we think about suicide, um, suicide issues as well as some of the homicide issues that we see in our communities. These are really shaped by gender in terms of prevention and response. <clears throat> Just to give you some data so that we can think about our frameworks really from an evidence-based, um, fr from a really robust evidence base. Many of you are familiar with our most recent data, national data from CDC on sexual violence as well as intimate partner violence. We see that about one in three women and one in six men in their lifetimes are victims of contact sexual violence, so involving physical contact. Um, and this translates to 23 million men, women and about 1.7 men. Um, and so we see the burden of this, um, whether or not we see it with our eyes, with our prevention hats on, with our clinician hats on, et cetera, we know that this is happening. Um, and, and some of this violence, quite unfortunately, actually does sort of fly below the radar. That's where public health comes in and can be really effective in prevention and response. Speaking about intimate partner violence uh, victimization, here we show the prevalence uh, by gender, and we see that about, um, I'm going to sort of direct you to the rape, physical violence, or stalking row there. We see uh, about one in three women have experienced these forms of intimate partner violence in her lifetime, uh, and about 28% of men. So that's striking. Um, and what we see on the following row is that the impact of this violence is really differential by gender. So about 28% of all women experience partner violence with some sort of impact. Um, and, the, and the level there for men is about 9%. So we're seeing some gender differences in how this affects people's lives. Why is this? We don't know. Um, is this because the violence wasn't as severe? That's a possibility. We see that in the, we see that in the data. Is it because there um, are some reporting issues or there may be some reluctance to actually access or report some of those needs? That may be a part of it as well. These are some of the issues that we don't have quite enough data that we uh, need to really mount this uh, response. But we do um, very consistently see this gender differential. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is very common across the three arms of violence that we're describing some frameworks on this morning is, is the need for early prevention, early intervention and early prevention. So here I offer you, again from the CDC data, the age at onset, the age at first victimization for sexual violence as well as for intimate partner violence, and this is just among female victims. And what's really stunning to us is, is this young age range. We've got our 11 to 17 year olds and our uh, 18 to 24 year olds. That's where the majority of people are having that first experience of violence. We've got a lot to take from that in terms of where we can access youth in school settings, in junior highs, or middle schools, in high schools, certainly in our college populations. But what we know is that we've got to get out there with early prevention and intervention. We didn't know this 20 years ago. We didn't know this 30 years ago. But the data are really clear. Um, and I think it's a really important theme as we think about some of the prevention strategies uh, across these three arms of violence. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, we've got gender differences as well in severity of violence victimization. So you've got about 24% uh, of women experiencing severe, some of the more severe forms of uh, partner violence. And we see this as well for men, but it's, only, it's about 13%. So it's, it's a, there's a clear gender differential in severity of violence. Again, very helpful in helping us understand and position prevention and also response needs. <clears throat> Um, and I want to as well highlight uh, really touching on our sexual violence uh, patterns in the population. Again, we're looking uh, again at the CDC data, and we see um, a comparison of the type of perpetrator for sexual violence by women and uh, for women and for men. We see that for female victims, by and large, we see that 
Uh, current or former intimate partners are really comprising the vast majority of perpetrators for sexual violence, as well as acquaintances. And for men, the profile is much different, where we see it's acquaintances as well as strangers. Um, and so the, the, the profile of what we're seeing in terms of perpetration is, uh, can be very different for men and for women. By and large, these are known perpetrators, right? The stranger column is generally the smallest or one of the smallest. So for those of us that went through the stranger danger education, um, we've come a long way since then, and we need to keep moving past that stranger danger, helping people identify the risks that they may have in known relationships and er intervene early. <clears throat> Uh, just to illustrate for us some trends over time, um, we, we happily have seen massive reductions in total violent crime over the past decades. Um, and we similarly have seen some reductions um, in total intimate partner violence, although uh, it, it's not quite as dramatic as, um, as, as what we'd like. What we are seeing, though, is an ability to learn from some of our interventions in the past and know that we're moving in the right direction. We need to keep um, continuing to push the envelope so that we can mitigate the burden of violence um, in our communities. I'm going to skip over this in the, in the interest of time and take us to um, just some of what we know in terms of health impact. Many of us in the room are very well familiar with the physical, sexual, and mental health consequences of uh, sexual violence and of intimate partner violence. Uh, coming back to our early prevention needs, um, we see so clearly that First, early victimization enables subsequent abuse, sets up risk for suicide, sets up risk for ongoing violence in relationships. Happily, what we actually know where we've studied it rigorously is that effective response actually mitigates uh, re-victimization as well as some of the mental health sequelae from, uh, from intimate partner and sexual violence. Uh, one of the reasons that we're all here, of course, is, is not only the burden, uh, but the economic toll. Um, many of the uh, health issues that are uh, after effects of violence are played out in lost productivity, in burden on the system. So we are able to, if we are effectively uh, resp responding to violence and preventing it, we are really making um, very important economic contributions as well. Um, and as well, uh, we know that, that gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, and sexual violence are among the most underreported crimes. So when we think about our justice response and our accountability arm of uh, violence prevention and response, we've got a long ways to go in terms of reducing barriers to effective justice response. Um, you see these quite staggering uh, estimates in terms of underreporting and uh, lack of reporting to police. Mm -mm. We're all here uh, to work towards violence prevention. Uh, and I want to really emphasize as we think about frameworks, two other important pillars of an effective response or a comprehensive response. So thinking of prevention not only as primary prevention, but also secondary, what we would think of as preventing re-victimization. Um, and these are obviously intertwined, but the, res the pr protection and response arm in terms of responding to the needs of survivors, secondary survivors, as well as primary survivors of violence, absolutely critical in this. Um, and of course, the accountability arm is ending impunity, ensuring that perpetrators are, hel are held accountable through our justice systems and also uh, outside the justice system. These things come together, uh, but it's really important to be thinking about these pillars simply because when we know the burden of violence, we go straight to prevention, and we've got to be meeting the needs of survivors in terms of health and support as well as access to justice. I'll give you uh, a framework building as well on the socioecologic model in terms of what is shaping risk very specifically for IPV and sexual violence. Um, you can see many of, many of the shared elements here. I'll call your attention to some of the pieces in the individual arm around resilience, empowerment to resist violence, as well as respond. So 
breaking down some of those barriers to raising a voice, telling someone about an abusive experience, and accessing help. These are low-hanging fruit for the violence prevention and response community. We're seeing a tremendous social movement on this now, and we can do much more around this element of empowerment and can really extend benefits as well to some of our other pillars. And I'll as well call your attention simply to the macro system pieces, um, the impunity that we tend to see in policy and practice, whether that's justice, whether that's workplace systems. Um, these are actionable areas for us in public health, places where we can learn tremendously from some of these other arms. Um, and this framework as well is just simply uh, I know we're going to be talking is more, more throughout the day about opportunities for response, but I'll leave you with this in terms of thinking about where can we go um, in violence prevention and response? What are our opportunities for response? We've all, always got early prevention and response. We've got resilience, self-empowerment, uh, self-defense, boundary setting, teaching skills to youth early. Um, as well as implementing actionable environmental changes on place to enhance safety, reduce isolation, enhance cohesion, community cohesion, um, enhance accountability for abuse, and really build in that accountability at a systems level as well, ensuring access to high quality systems and building in accountability channels through our justice systems as well as through our workplace policies, uh, school and educational policies. All of these are opportunities for us for reform. Um, and I'm just thrilled to uh, have an opportunity to have this conversation with all of us over the course of our day around where we can really position uh, to enhance safety and support for, uh, for violent survivors. Thanks. So we're going to shift gears now, and we're going to talk about self-directed violence, if I can get this up. Here we go. OK. So in terms of suicide, um, it's the 10th leading cause of death overall. Um, the most recent data we have available, unfortunately, are from 2015, although the 2016 data is going to be released by the CDC any second. But we had over 44,000 suicides in 2015. Um, this is one of my, my favorite epidemiology slides. Just in terms of, you can think back to Daniel's slide that he showed on homicide and how you see that steep peak starting at around age 10 and going up to around age 24. And, and that's among males. The, the orange line are males. The yellow line is females. In suicide, we use this metric very frequently, the rate per 100,000. And so that's what's plotted here, the rate per 100,000 population, um, looking at suicide death by gender and, and, and across different age groups. And the one thing that I find like a great opportunity for us who do suicide prevention is the steep peak among men. Uh, males early on in life and and what's driving that we know from brain development the brain continues to develop until age you know mid age 20 25 26 so there's impulsivity decision making factors that play into this depression alcohol isolation all these factors that I'll get back to in a second and so the ideological of the the etiology of suicide in, in this steep peak for males early on in life is quite different from the steep peak that you see in, in late life for males. There are some overlapping risk factors, but some different risk factors. And you see for females, the, the suicides are highest in midlife, in more, most frequent. And it's the same for males. The bulk of the suicides that happen in the United States are, are um, from people who are middle-aged, and that's kind of broadly defined anywhere from you know, 40 up into 65. And so that's where most of the suicide happened. 
And, and the, the challenge for the field is, you know, how can we capture people for intervention? And it's easier um, when folks are captive in school or in late life when they're captive in primary care. So there's some real opportunities for those who are captive in different service settings, but in midlife, some people are not. Um, this finding, this uh, figure here is from a paper that was released from the CDC last year that got a lot of attention. And the main punchline was that the suicide rate, when you compare the rate in 1999 to 2014, has increased 24% overall. So despite better treatments, despite more funding for suicide prevention, still way too little, but more uh, over time, um, what we're doing isn't uh, effective enough. And so we, we need to really think, rethink our strategy and, and think about innovation. Now in terms of frameworks, this is whenever you apply for a grant, whenever I apply for a grant, you put in the wrong framework, the one people don't like, and you're criticized, so you cannot win. But, and this is overly simplistic. But I think it's worth me just spending a couple minutes just to, to orient you to some of how the risk and protective factors uh, hang together in time. And this model is, um, was developed by one of my mentors, David Schaffer, who's a child psychiatrist that I worked very closely with and continue to, to, to work with, although he's retired. Um, and, and this model, I think, is useful for sh thinking about short-term risk. You know, clinical risk, you have a patient in your office, you have a um, research participant who's sitting in front of you and thinking about their, thinking about their risk. This model is limited, I will say, because it doesn't have a lot of the distal factors, um, you know, childhood-oriented events that, that were mentioned by Daniel and Michelle, and um, it doesn't have genetics included, family history, and so forth. You, so it's limited in that respect. It's, it's not a full picture, but it gives you an idea of how to think about risk when, when someone's sitting in front of you and you're worrying about them. And this whole idea of a stress diathesis, you know, having an acute, someone having an acute stressor in the context of them having some sort of vulnerability that's mental health oriented. And that combination is what you see in a lot of the models and frameworks for suicide prevention, that those things kind of interact together to increase risk in time. So oftentimes there's an active psychiatric disorder. It doesn't have to be a disorder, it could be symptoms, depression, mood disorders are, are so highly linked with suicide. It could be anxiety related issues, substance abuse, um, ag aggressive impulsive traits. Um, and, and that active, that context of a vulnerability that's mental health oriented can interact with an acute stressor. And the most common acute stressors that we see are a relationship breakup, humiliation and arrest, um, some other type of really acute stressor that within the context of some background risk, the person is really struggling. Um, the, the next part, of, uh, and this is very simplistic and cartoonistic, but you're, you're getting the point. And this actually is based on quite a bit of research and, and clinical work. But oftentimes you see with the, in the context of the risk and the, the background risk and the stress, you can often sometimes see an acute change in the way that person looks, the way they're acting. They may have really a lot of anticipatory anxiety. They may, um, you may see an acute change in, in how aggressive they are, um, which could lead to ideation. And at that point, they're inhibiting factors and facilitating factors. And the, in terms of inhibition, the social factors, social context in suicide, the social factors and connectedness and social integration and interventions that increase social connectedness are the most robust protective factors um, in the literature. Um, and also support having somebody physically present because they can intervene if the person tries to make an attempt. Um, and f facilitating factors are impulsive, aggressive traits. Oftentimes, if somebody is that way, quick from thought to action, and there happens to be a firearm in the home, there's no going back. 90% um, of people who um, 
use a firearm f for suicide uh, die, do not survive. And so that's highly lethal method. So method comes in here, access to methods, recent examples in the media, 13 reasons why everyone's talking about, and um, other uh, irresponsible reporting of suicides on TV and the media. So people feeling like this is an option. They, they're know, they know about it, they've heard about it, being alone and, and so forth. So these two different paths can lead to survival or suicide. And like I said, it's simplistic, but it was worth walking you through it. Because of the findings that I showed you from the CDC, there's been a lot of attention um, on what to do about these increasing suicide rates. So in 2015, there were 44,193 suicides. So one approach that the a partnership was developed called the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. It's a public-private partnership with lots of people involved, stakeholders, decision makers, came together to try to solve this problem. And also, um, we have the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, so try to implement the goals of that strategy and try to reduce the suicide rate. So one approach that they took to this is to figure out where the suicides are happening. What methods are people who, do, you know, so kind of going back from the 44,000 and figuring out where to intervene, where should we put our resources? We only have, we have few resources, where should they be allocated? And so um, where can we reach these people who die by suicide? And one thing we do know is that healthcare is one um, place where you, you can see folks. So within the year before um, they, these die by suicide, this was, these calculations were done to kind of go back and around 10,000 um, people will be seen in an emer on average in an emergency department for a suicide attempt in the year before they die by suicide. And maybe about half of those, slightly less than half, will be seen in healthcare, most likely by a primary care physician when, within 30 days. So these are using papers, uh, national data, and papers that have come out to make approximations of where to locate and how to allocate resources for suicide prevention. And you can see, in terms of military veterans, the data have been fairly consistent that, you know, you've probably heard 20 suicides per day, 22 suicides per day by veterans. And so that the, the, about 20% of the people who die by suicide um, are veterans. So there's great promise um, in doing interventions and trying to do outreach to that population. So which strategies are most effective for preventing suicide? What the research shows is that comprehensive, multi-component approaches are most effective. There's a the study done by the US Air Force that has received a lot of attention. And, and really, it was like buy-in from the leadership of the Air Force and multiple components of an intervention that was done over time. But the thing that one major finding, even though we know that comprehensive multi-component approaches are, are most impactful, they're not if they're not sustained. Because the second the Air Force study stopped, the rates went back to what they were before. So this is a huge challenge for our field. We need to figure out, we can't, we can't work on grants, on three, four year grants. We need more sustained prevention that's embedded within service systems um, so that we can real, really make an impact over time. In, in terms of suicide interventions, most are uh, focused on identifying those who are already at risk, like gatekeeper training programs where people are trained to identify folks who are already in crisis. And, and to just echo what Michelle said, we really need to think more upstream and, and focus more on um, prevention, early intervention. So the um, MHGAP program is one framework for um, where they've actually done a literature review on for self-directed violence, figuring out which programs should be prioritized, which programs have the which types of programs have the most evidence. And I'm going to show you two sets by MHGAP, and I'm going to quickly go through because I don't have much time. So the quality of the evidence is low for these widely used approaches here. Assessment for self-harm, this first one is mostly screening. Screening done in non-medical, 
non-specialized health. So in non-specialized health, we hear we specialized health is psychiatry in this context. So within primary care and other non-specialized psychiatry settings, screening those who have some baseline level of risk because they may have a psychiatric disorder. So for that's recommended, but the evidence is kind of low for that. Removing um, means of self-harm, usefulness of regular contact. This is like following up with patients when you know they're at risk, sending them postcards, sending them letters, calling to check on them, which you think would be done in routine practice when you're managing and taking care of patients, but unfortunately it's not. Um, the use of social support or trying to increase social supports for individuals at risk and school-based uh, interventions. The evidence is slightly stronger according to the MHGAP program, which is a World Health Organization initiative, for these four approaches. And um, so problem-solving therapy. And this is kind of stated in a broad sense. What this really is is giving people skills so that when they're in crisis and they're having difficulty regulating their emotions and their behavior, they have a, a, a skill set to use to get themselves through it. And it could be th therapy in the context of a mental health setting or it could be with caseworkers or with peers who can be trained in how to work with patients to give them these, the, the skill set to help them through crisis. So they, they'll have this going forward to take with them. Re reducing access to means of suicide, which we'll talk quite a bit about today. Reducing the availability of alcohol, which we'll hear about later as well. And the responsible um, in deglamorization of, of media reporting, which is a, a really a big issue. And I'm just going to end um, right here with the point of, with the summary of how do we achieve um, population impact on suicide? And I've mentioned that you know we do have evidence-based programs. We don't have enough, but we do. But for some reason, these are not embedded and, and they're not fully institutionalized and haven't been sent to scale throughout the United States. And so that's a challenge for us um, in achieving that objective and, and thinking about how to get the supports in place and the political backing to get some of these evidence-based early programs um, implemented more broadly. Uh, embedding programs into services, I think, is essential so that people are doing prevention as part of their job. Teachers in health class are teaching, um, giving students skill, material and skills that, that, that will benefit them, and health class has a lot of wasted time. We should be using that for more productive public health related messaging and interventions. Um, in emergency departments, other healthcare settings, safety is a goal. Why don't we do more in terms of screening and identification and interventions to um, support folks at risk? Um, and we definitely need more innova innovation. So I will pause there. I'll stop there, because our next session is going to be on innovation. So we're very excited about that. And I believe we have time for questions. Yeah, we're going to have a little uh, time for discussion. Um, actually, Michelle, maybe if you could come forward. We'll just sort of here and <clears throat> this my voice is going I'm going to get in a mic um, as, as I indicated with the open room remarks this is this is a starting place and um, the great thing about public health is the diversity and how people approach and think about these things so um, I know when I look back at my own, I thought, wow, should be more talk about trauma here. But there's a lot of ways that we need to sort of fill in gaps. So let me just give you an opportunity. Somebody wants to jump in. Jackie, all right. OK, you knew I was going to go trauma. <laughs> <laughs> that I did. That was not planned. <laughs> as well as in the city as a whole. So um, that's one of the backdrops. And I think that um, some of the things that I've been thinking about the last few years, and I've done research on domestic violence, 
domestic violence, homicide for a very long time. And I think we are failing to address the trauma. The trauma from our communities, the trauma that our young people are growing up in, uh, in terms of community violence that they see, as well as violence in their homes. <coughs> and then very importantly, especially in a city like Baltimore, the racial injustice, um, the uh, discrimination, the everyday racism that our kids are experiencing as they grow up. And then with that kind of underlay, we wonder why when we only teach how to do different conflict resolution, um, different norms, that our kids too often still use violence. And I'm saying the word use violence, not perpetrate, not offend. Too often in this city and around the country, people who use violence also experience violence. It's the same people. And our young people, especially our young black men in this city, the amount of trauma that they've experienced and what it's done to their brains, we have good brain science, and how if we only teach, we ignore that need to heal the trauma. And one other thing I wanna say, as a person who has said for 20 years, hold offenders accountable. We have to be careful about that language. Especially in domestic violence, I know that it is black men who are held accountable in a criminal justice way. And when I see in terms of financing, I hear our governor saying that the solution to the violence in the city is policing and longer sentences, not attention to social determinants of health. So that's... All right, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Thomas. Hi, uh, Thomas Hepp from the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, first of all, thank you for three excellent uh, initial presentations getting us uh, started uh, off to a strong start. Uh, just a quick response to the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the initial comment that I'll ask a question, then I'll ask a second question. Um, uh, the, the first, uh, you, made, you mentioned policing. Uh, and the implication was that uh, policing is always put forward as the answer, and there's actually a competing and maybe better answer. I would think that given the mix of people in the room, one of the things that we're going to address today is how public health and public safety can work together and not at odds with one another. So I'd love your thoughts, each of you, as to that, um, and not a sort of either or, but a both and strategy. The second question is uh, something that I think is very not very uh, well understood, but I think we all recognize as an issue, is the interconnections between all of these forms of violence. How can we learn more about that? How can we sort of tighten up our understanding of the relationships there, and what are, what are sort of future areas for research there? Thank you. Well, those are, those are both huge questions. I don't know if we can fully uh, address them, but I'm gonna take the first one, because I think maybe that is pretty central. Um, I, I've spent my life kind of straddling these worlds, public safety, public health, and um, I do think that they can and should be complementary. I think what we're, um, part of uh, the frustration that um, public health feels right now has to do with bad policing. And we can all agree, nobody likes bad policing, nobody likes unjust uh, sentencing. Um, so in my view, that is part of the solution is part of the solution is to address bad policing, bad criminal justice, and why I put on my slide that equity is part of this whole process. But I think we have to be careful to think 
we have to rethink how we think about police and accountability. I, I believe actually there's a very solid base of evidence along this spectrum, well, maybe it applies less to suicide, but in terms of partner violence as well as community violence, that um, without accountability you have more violence. So the question is, well, what, how do you have accountability and who is accountable and can you do it justly and productively? And I think ultimately that's sort of the central question that we're, we're facing right now. We've had, in our city in particular, as you know, Jackie, we, we have went through the pains of zero tolerance and all of that bad things that, that go with that. We're now trying to reimagining what our communities need and want. We're, we had been over-policed by minor offenses to try to make an excuse to arrest someone and that really kind of screws up their life in many ways. Um, but not giving the attention to the, you know, this whole contagion phenomenon that we know is pretty central. Um, if we're not holding people accountable for, accountable for shooting people, that contagious process, we, those violence interrupters are gonna work really, 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 really hard and not as effectively if, if there's a lot of street justice. You know, we don't want street justice, right? Our workers are trying to, the outreach is trying to prevent street justice. So we want another form of justice. So I think those are the kind of things that we'll be talking about today. Not that the answer isn't there's no policing or criminal justice. Of course, we need them. But what does it look like and, and where does public health play in? And, and my orientation is always on um, prevention is, is outcomes and equity. Outcomes and equity. But. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Just to just to weigh in on that, and I really am so thankful that the issues around um, policing are, are starting. You know, very from our very first session that we're having today, and just to just to really think through these issues, especially for sexual violence and partner violence, the the police reforms that are needed to restore trust or build that initial trust and prevent the overzealous response that is not equitably distributed are the exact reforms that are needed to ensure that there is an option for justice, especially for people whose crimes have been historically minimized. And I'm thinking specifically about sexual violence. Many people in this room are familiar with the, some of the issues and barriers to justice, especially for sexual violence in Baltimore City that we saw in the Justice Department uh, investigation in 2016 and dating back to 2010 when we saw that Baltimore was one of the leaders in unfounded rape cases. So as much as we need victims of violence to be comfortable reporting that they won't be overzealously responded to, they also need to know that they do have a legitimate option to report to police in a way that they won't be minimized, their case won't be dropped, they will actually get that option should they so choose. So I, I think that, that these reforms really need to um, transcend that whole spectrum. I, did you want to make, I, I, we're going to transition, right, but it, do you have something quick you want to add? Just really or? quick, from the suicide perspective, the police are often first to the scene and it's typically, it's a crime scene. The family's there, they're grieving, they're like in shock, they're traumatized. And so that whole interaction between the police and the family, there's such opportunity for first responders and training them how to, how to approach the family and how to interact with the family. Right. So this is just, we're just starting. And we're going to have some great breakout discussions really soon. One of the things, um, I want to transition now to our next panel. So. Uh, Thank you very much. As, as a researcher, you know, I, I love to talk about evidence and, and what we know works. Um, but a lot of what we know works is stuff that was developed many years ago, like decades ago. And we need to continue to innovate if we're going to have big impacts on violence. We do not have all the answers at all. The, I think there's an interesting discussions we can have throughout the day of sort of how, and, and actually they are, they are built into our dis, uh, breakout discussions of how do you facilitate effective innovation? 
Um, but we're going to start at least that conversation with one way that innovation, not the only way that innovation is driven, but is in new and, and more powerful ways to use data. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator of our next session, who is Dr. David Luxton. He is the founder and CEO of Luxton Labs. Um, he's also affiliate associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Um, he's also chief science officer at the Suicide Prevention not, um, Not-for-Profit Organization Now Matters Now in Seattle. Um, and I uh, want to thank you, Dr. Buxton, uh, Luxon, I'm sorry, uh, and you can introduce our, our next speakers. Good morning. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but I'm a technologist, so I study technology and its implementation in behavioral health and in public health. I worked for years, uh, served in and worked for the U.S. military for years, primarily in suicide prevention, also in technology applications like telehealth, mobile health, and again in public health. Uh, my interests are now primarily in artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning applications. And I also work for a, another startup company called TQ Intelligence. We're doing some innovative stuff with voice analytics, uh, capturing voice characteristics in um, adolescents and then predicting emotional distress, which has high applicability to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but uh, I'm very excited to um, uh, moderate this next session about uh, data innovations. Uh, this is really the innovative stuff uh, that really drives both, I think, uh, intervention, um, public health kind of awareness of, um, of uh, risks, and also uh, policy as well. Uh, I think we're going to start with, um, Mark, you're going to start? Okay. So let me introduce, uh, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers first. Uh, so we're kind of a bit, I think, behind time a bit, so we're going to move pretty quickly. And we do hope to uh, have uh, some time for discussion here. Uh, as a panel. Okay, so Dr. Mark Dreds is an associate professor in computer science at John Hopkins University. He has affiliations in the Malone Center for Healthcare Engineering and Applied Physics Lab, the Human Language Technology Center of Excellence, and the Center for Language and Speech Processing, and the Center for Population Health Information Technology. He holds an appointment in uh, Health Sciences Informatics in the School of Medicine, and his research in natural language processing and machine learning has focused on graphical models, semi-supervised learning, information extraction, large-scale learning, and speech processing. Uh, and then I'm also going to introduce uh, Kim Smith, who I'm very excited to meet. Uh, she is a research manager at the University of Chicago Crime Lab, where she manages the multi-city gun markets project, work done in partnership with affiliates in six major U.S. cities, uh, including here in Baltimore. And uh, Kim also provides project management and implementation support to the Chicago Police Department's scale up of its strategic decision support centers. Uh, and she's been involved with the installed in the most violent, uh, it's installed in the most violent police districts in the city. And the strategic decision support centers bring together police officers and analysts from the crime lab to integrate crime intelligence, data analysis, and technology. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Mark. Thank you. All right, let me plug you in. Hi, everyone. All right, good morning, everyone. Hi. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of different things this morning just to give you an idea of kind of the variety of uh, of work that's uh, going on in this space, uh, and it reflects uh, collaborations with a lot of people at different institutions. Um, so as we've heard this morning already, um, there is a need for more funding, more research around uh, gun violence prevention. Uh, this is a plot I really like. This shows number of publications per year. Those are the bars uh, around um, uh, firearms uh, and violence. Uh, and then the dotted line is the total number of academic publications per year in millions. Um, and basically what you can see is that the lack of access to funding really has an impact on the amount of research that's being done. Uh, you'll also see the staggering number of academic papers that are put out. I feel like I'm not keeping up, but whatever. That's not the main point here. That's my own issues. All right, um, and so one of the, uh, the, uh, the big consequences of this is that we often don't have data 
in order to support the sort of uh, policy decisions that we want to make around gun violence issues, right? And uh, I'm a b big believer in evidence-based medicine and evidence-based policy making, and if you don't have the evidence, it's very hard to make good policy. Uh, and so one of the things I think about is how we can build better evidence, uh, better data with the available resources we have. And because we don't have the sort of funding uh, and opportunities that we would have for other areas of public health, we have to be a little bit more creative. And so um, I've been looking with my colleagues at uh, web data sources. These are sources of data that already exist, that are oftentimes freely available online, but aren't traditionally thought of as public health resources. Uh, so these are things like social media data, or uh, web queries, or news data, or um, uh, forum data, things that happen already, things where people are discussing issues relevant to public health, uh, but public health as a field isn't uh, normally tuned into these sources. Um, so what I want to do just to start with is give you guys a couple examples of the sort of work we can do using this data for uh, a variety of different topics. So I'll give a couple brief examples here. Uh, and then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about some of the ways we've been using this data in order to understand uh, gun violence in the United States and public reactions to gun violence issues. Um, so the four broad areas in which we find ourselves using this data are uh, evaluating awareness campaigns and just population awareness in general. So uh, awareness is a major issue in public health. Uh, and so we've tried to use this data to have a better understanding of the impact of these campaigns and actually what is the awareness of a population. Uh, measuring reactions to events, uh, that's very, very re uh, relevant uh, in the gun violence space, but things happen in the world that are relevant to different issues of health and the population reacts. And understanding how they react tells us whether or not our messaging is effective and what better messaging and intervention strategies we can develop. Uh, surveillance is key across all areas of public health uh, and how we can do a better job of just finding out what's going on on the ground. Uh, and then media monitoring is an area where you see come up a lot. We're trying to understand how issues around health are portrayed in the media, how they're expressed, and whether or not um, we're, our messaging and our strategies are actually making it through and being pre uh, presented accordingly. So I have probably a dozen examples that I will not give. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, about, uh, about these different topics. So I'll just I'll do three. Is three OK? Three. Good. Three. Um, uh, so one that we did uh, last year around uh, uh, a reaction to event was 13 Reasons Why. Uh, I'll just do a show of hands. How many people have heard of 13 Reasons Why? Okay, that's everyone. How many people have seen it? Less, okay. I don't see a lot of teenagers in the room, so that's understandable. Um, so uh, there was a lot of debate when this came out. This was a really great example of opinions. Lots and lots of debate when this came out about what effect the show would have, but it's very hard to say what effect the show actually has beyond anecdotal evidence. And so what we did is we turned to web data, and we specifically turned to just Google searches, and we asked a simple question, which is how did what people were searching for online around suicide change after the show is released, right? So we don't know if that change was because of the show, but we can say how it did change after the show, and maybe we can try and use that to support different conclusions. And what we found were that um, searches on Google for things related to suicide were about 19% higher after the show was released. Uh, that translated into about a million and a half additional searches that we wouldn't have expected to be made. Uh, and while we did see increases in things like um, suicide hotline, we saw lots of increases in things like how to commit suicide, how to kill yourself. Uh, and anecdotally, after we published this work, we started getting emails from clinicians and sadly parents who were relaying to us stories where they had made observations or unfortunately their children had died um, from suicide and uh, they said, well, that was the day after they saw the show or something like that, right? So we were able to provide some evidence to support a lot of anecdotal observations. Um, another example of things that we work on are uh, media, team, media monitoring. So here's a platform we've built uh, here at Hopkins with the uh, Tobacco Control Center uh, called Tobacco Watcher. And uh, Tobacco Watcher basically looks all over the world for articles related to tobacco 
um, and smoking, and not only brings them all together in one place, but it does so across about a dozen languages, translating everything into English, and it organizes and analyzes the content. So a lot of the questions that our partners want to ask, like uh, how many articles are talking about age restrictions or flavor restrictions, and in Indonesia, how many articles were using this phrase, right? Those sort of analyses, which were normally done manually by coding stories, are all fu fully automated in our system. And so you can automatically go to one of the panels and say, well, show me uh, how many articles are being published every day in China that talk about age restrictions now as compared to last year, right? Uh, and so that makes me Toronto much more effective. So let me give you some examples of the work we're uh, doing in the gun violence space and how we're using these sorts of technologies uh, to further our understanding about gun violence in the United States. And both examples are gonna uh, uh, center around Sandy Hook because it was really a watershed moment in the United States. Uh, or at least many people hoped it would be. Uh, and I'm going to tell you examples of two different sorts of data we looked at. Uh, one was Google Trends and one was Twitter. Uh, and I'm just going to give you some examples of what we were able to do to give you a flavor of the sorts of questions you can ask of this data and, and what's really available, right? So this data, uh, we didn't have to create this data. It exists. We just had to download it and do the analysis. Uh, so let's start with some examples from Google. Um, so I think a lot of people in this room and across the United States had this sense that Sandy Hook was different in some way, right? That this was a watershed moment, and this shooting, even though we have many shootings, this shooting was somehow different. Uh, but it's very hard to um, uh, measure that difference, right? Like how much, is that feeling that it's different somehow actually measurable in some way? And so what we did is we looked at uh, searches for guns over the past uh, 10 years before, um, yeah, 10 years, uh, and just looked at how these correlate with different incidents of mass shootings in the United States. So we identified about 50 uh, uh, mass shootings, um, and you can see that there are some, you know, that, uh, that kind of come at peaks, some that seem not to, uh, but it's pretty clear here there is uh, an outlier, right, which is right here, and this is Sandy Hook, right? So if you have the sense that people's interest in gun violence was different in some way, it's pretty obvious by looking at just how many people went online to learn about this issue uh, was really different, and that was really a, a change point uh, over time. Um, so we could also break these down by what shootings actually garner the most interest. And if you look to the left, I know it's a little hard to see, you'll see things like uh, Newton, which is uh, Newtown, which is Sandy Hook, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Tulsa, Oklahoma, San Bernardino, Orlando, Colorado Springs, Aurora. So all these are unfortunately very familiar terms. And these are the shootings that I recognize, they stand out. And so our data supports that, that really the number of people going online and searching for information about guns was highest after these incidents, but then we have a long tail of shootings that uh, I mostly have not heard of uh, where you see basically no change from baseline, right? Some even have a drop, which is probably not really significant, but you see most of these really don't register a, a change, right? So this is a way where we can actually measure what's going on in the population, but uh, what's great is we can break this down not just by did people search for guns, but what they were looking for specifically. So this is the year of Sandy Hook um, compared to the year before. Uh, and so there's a lot of seasonality, so we want to look at year over year. Uh, and you can see then 2013 uh, as opposed to uh, 2012 as opposed to 2011, there is a big spike, right? Uh, but then you can see the spike changes depending on what people are searching for. So gun shopping, lots of people look for information about gun shopping. We can't tell if that's because they want to purchase guns or they want to see if they could purchase, you know, I don't know. Uh, but you see that we had really an elevated rate for months after the shooting. And then again, when Obama made his big speech about a legislative push, uh, there was a big interest in gun shopping, which again correlates with a lot of uh, what we know about gun purchasing behavior. Uh, gun storage safes, we saw a large increase that was sustained, uh, but then things like background checks actually drop off, right? So there's a big increase, but then it kind of returns to a low level. You have another big increase around Obama's speech, which centered around uh, universal background checks, and then kind of dropped off. And so a lot of anecdotal evidence you hear about the difference between people and the pro-gun rights and pro-gun control, you can start to see in this data. Um, so in the couple minutes I have left, let me give you some examples uh, of Twitter data and what we looked at there. And um, the difference here, broadly speaking, is Google data is really good at telling you what people are interested in. 
right? Because they are going to Google looking for some kind of information, right? But lots of people have opinions, uh, and they don't go to Google and type in what those opinions are, right? Because they're not looking for any information on them. And so Twitter is really good for understanding public reactions and public perceptions, right? What people are talking about, what people think about these issues. Right? And so we had uh, just some very simple questions, which were, what were people talking about uh, in the wake of Sandy Hook? Right? Um, we know that interest spiked from Google data, but what was the sort of conversation people were having? Uh, so let me give you just some examples of what people are tweeting. Uh, so uh, gun control tweets look something like this. You can see like they're talking about uh, pro-gun rights uh, events or opinions. Um, um, so yeah, gun control tweets look something like this. Uh, and if you've been online and you've been on social media, these should look very familiar to you as the sorts of things that people talk about. But rather than looking at one tweet at a time, we want to look at millions of tweets and try and uh, uh, come up with some quantitative analysis about what they were saying. Um, so here's just a look at just raw um, numbers of how many people were pushing gun rights tweets and how many people were publishing gun control tweets. Um, for the months or the year after Sandy Hook, right? See, so what's interesting here is you can see that overall, right, there are more uh, tweets about gun control, right? However, the gun rights tweets kind of have a more steady stream, right? People are uh, more engaged in this issue in a consistent way on the gun rights side. On the gun control side, it's very responsive to events that are happening, right? So when the president says there's going to be a gun control, you see a big increase, uh, but then it kind of drops down, and you don't see these kind of uh, fluctuations in the same way. Um, but then beyond just how many people are talking about it, of course, we want to know what they're saying. Right? And so what we used is a, a model um, from computer science called the topic model that essentially can analyze millions of uh, messages uh, uh, that are written out, uh, really in any language. And it sorts them according to the different topics of discussion. And then we can go in and look at those groupings and say, OK, well, we recognize what this topic here is. We recognize that all these tweets have some common topic to them. And then we can manually write out what we think that is. Uh, and so we looked at uh, millions of topics over that year. We looked at the discovered topics, and then we um, organized them around whether or not they were mostly uh, gun control or gun rights topics. So was this topic primarily used by one side or the other? And then how what people were talking about changed as different events happened. So I'll show you an example. Um, so this is for gun rights. And the way to read this, uh, I know it's a little hard with the colors, the far left bar is an overall distribution of the, uh, the major topics here, uh, color coded. And the right hand side is our naming of those. So uh, I'm not so great with colors, so maybe you can help me. Uh, but I think basically the bottom one is conservative hashtags gun registry. So lots of tweets talking about you know, kind of just using uh, conservative hashtags in general, as well as a bunch of things talking about you know, uh, whether or not there's going to be a gun registry. Uh, you can see other categories for things like uh, discussions about local gun laws, discussion of the Second Amendment, discussion about the uh, filibuster in the Senate. Um, uh, Bongino, does anyone know who Bongino is? Show of hands. No one voted for Bongino here? OK. Uh, Bongino is, I think he's a former Secret Service agent who kind of rose to prominence as a conservative voice. Uh, he has run for Congress, I think, three times in three different states. Uh, you can check that on Wikipedia. He's not in Congress, though. But, uh, but he is, I mean, like, he kind of rose to prominence over this time. And you can actually see people talking about him increased over time. So this plot, you can read left to right. Uh, the left one is overall. Uh, just in all the, for the whole year following, what topics were dominant. Uh, but then you can see in response to specific events, like the national legislation being proposed, or the hearings in the Senate, or Connecticut passing their gun uh, control bill, you can see how those topics change. Right? So this is a way where we can look at not just handfuls of data, but we can look at millions and millions of pieces of data. Uh, and try and quantify the conversation happening online. Uh, I'll just show you quickly what this looks like for uh, gun control. You can see issues here like uh, discussions of the NRA. We have discussions of uh, foreign gun violence, so like comparing domestic to, uh, to foreign gun violence, which happens a lot on, on social media. Uh, model gun control policies, so talking about like, well, uh, this would be like a great policy. We should have that. Uh, boycotts, safety issues. And again, you can see how these uh, vary over time as different events are happening. 
Um, so just one more question uh, that I want to address that we get a lot was, is this really valid, right? Are we, what are we measuring here? And is what we're measuring actually correspond to any kind of data we have about, let's say, the real world? Uh, and so what we did was we pulled uh, telephone survey data um, that was available from this year uh, from public policy polling where they did state level surveys for 20 different states asking, would you support or oppose requiring background checks for all gun sales, including gun shows and the internet, right? And basically, we took all of our Twitter data, we divided it up into state-by-state -state data, and just looked at the fraction of how many people were in favor of gun control versus gun rights, and tried to compare that breakdown to support for this. Now, of course, we're measuring different things, right? One is uh, overall support of gun control versus gun rights uh, versus this specific issue where there's a lot more support for, right? But it helps us just see if we're tracking anything meaningful. Uh, and I think overall, we are surprised by uh, how well we could correlate these two, uh, where we are showing here how many gun control tweets there are versus support for uh, universal background checks. Um, there's obviously a lot more we'd want to do to actually get telephone survey quality data out of social media data, but it just gives us a, a brief sense that we are on the right track and that what we're looking at is a reflection of what we see in the real world. Um, so I want to talk about this today because I really think of this as a way forward in a, a data poor space to actually building up evidence in a cost effective way, right? So um, we have lots of other questions we want to ask, like what events trigger gun purchases? Uh, what are popular safety aids that people are searching for? Um, what is the kind of public awareness around gun violence issues? And what we think we have here is a very general framework for trying to answer questions that normally you might turn to survey data for, if, it, if at all, uh, but we can look at social media data uh, in a funding poor environment. Uh, if you like these examples, I will plug my book, which just came out, uh, but uh, it's free on my website. So you don't have to actually buy it, uh, and I'll lose the 12 cents per copy, I guess, or whatever I'm supposed to get. Uh, and uh, we do talk about gun violence in the book, but we talk about lots of other issues. So if you think these sorts of uh, methods might be applicable to what you're working on, I encourage you to go to my website, take a look at the book, which just gives you lots of examples of what people have done, uh, much more than I can do in the time I have here. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kim Smith. I'm from the University of Chicago Crime Lab where I'm a research manager. The University of Chicago Crime Lab partners with uh, city agencies, practitioners to evaluate and identify promising solutions to control violence. Um, we also study the effects of policies um, that are intended to reduce the harms of the criminal justice system. And today I'm going to talk to you about the Strategic Decision Support Center initiative. Um, it's a bold initiative that uh, was kind of kicked off at the beginning of this year to address gun violence in Chicago. So I'll just get right into it. Um, in 2016, Chicago's homicide rate increased almost 60%. Um, as you can see in the previous years, uh, the homicide, the number of victims was kind of stubbornly around 400 to 500, uh, but the, the sharp and dramatic increase was really what kind of spurred this innovation. Um, and just to put Chicago's increase in context, there were 279 additional homicide victims in 2016. Um, in New York City, a city with three times as many people, there were only 335 victims. So I think the city of Chicago, understandably, um, had to move quickly to reverse the tide. And this, uh, this project that I'm about to speak to you about is one such effort. Um, so there are many questions about the, the, you know, what was the increase a result of? What was the cause? Um, at the University of Chicago, we tried to, you know, get at that question. We looked at a lot of data, and essentially our results were inconclusive. Um, we weren't, you know... 100% sure that any one factor led to the increase, but one thing that we did see was that uh, one measure of police activity, uh, street stops, did drop off near the end of 2015, and it seemed to you know, coincide with the increase. And so while you know, economic conditions and, and social segregation certainly need to be addressed in the longer term um, and medium term, uh, we thought that you know, police activity um, might be part of the short-term solution. 
So this map is a map of Chicago divided into its uh, police districts. And each police district has you know, several tens of thousands of people, is an average of 10 square miles. And as you can see, uh, homicide is, uh, and gun violence um, is severely concentrated in a handful of districts. Um, each district is run by a commander, and each commander has several hundred officers um, at their disposal. So, uh, you know, considering that districts are the size of small cities, it is incredibly important that commanders understand where crime is happening so they can deploy their resources um, appropriately. Uh, so when we, you know, when we were thinking about police innovations and solutions, um, it was kind of obvious that we should pilot and test uh, this new program in the most violent police district in Chicago. So we uh, we launched this program in District Seven, which is kind of on the south side, the darkest purple, um, and District Eleven on the west side, the L-shaped district, uh, in February of 2006. 2017, um, and taking a step back, near the end of 2016, the Department of Justice brought in a team of law enforcement experts to essentially perform a technical assessment of the Chicago Police Department's crime fighting capacity. And what these experts saw, uh, led by the Chief of Staff of the Los Angeles Police Department, Sean Malinowski, what they saw was that the city of Chicago had uh, a great amount of technology and data available to its officers, but it was you know, severely underutilized, and it wasn't necessarily being integrated in a way that could leverage um, you know, the benefits of each. Uh, additionally, district commanders were not um, necessarily equipped with the capacity to use this data to inform their daily deployment decisions, and you know, in a way that could help them manage their resources more effectively. So what uh, Sean Malinowski and the team of experts from DOJ uh, recommended was that Chicago kind of push out information and technology and data to the districts and embed civilian analysts, kind of bring everything together so that it could be used at a very localized level to address very specific, um, uh, you know, specific issues that affect uh, these districts. Uh, so fast forward to uh, February 1st of this year, uh, the Sh city of Chicago built out these uh, strategic decision support centers. And what they are, they're rooms within police districts um, that look exactly like this. Uh, there's a big conference table. There are a few TVs. Um, I think out of view are the computer stations. And sitting in this room 24-7 are sworn Chicago Police Department officers who are using the array of technology to monitor crime and developments within the district and inform um, you know, district plans. Uh, throughout the week, there are what we call um, meetings that kind of integrate everything. And uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of show you what the rooms look like um, before going into it any further. In terms of the timeline, uh, the plan was initially to open two of these strategic decision support centers in Chicago. Uh, so the first two, District 7 and 11, uh, went live on February 1st. About three weeks after we went live, the mayor of Chicago, really impressed with the results, decided to open four more districts. Uh, so when we thought we were going to have about six months to kind of fine tune the program and then you know, scale, we actually had three weeks. Um, but I think you know, because the results were so promising, uh, it made a lot of sense to see how we could scale this. So what exactly you know, are the SDSCs um, and what is included? This is kind of how we break it out uh, in terms of new technology and new processes. I'll go over these you know, kind of quickly, but happy to answer questions about any one of them uh, during the discussion period. Officers in each of the SDSC districts received uh, department-issued mobile phones, and the, the goal was to you know, allow officers to access the technology remotely from their cars when they were out in the, in the districts. Um, there, we rolled out a predictive policing software called HunchLab. Uh, Hunch Lab is, uh, they use risk terrain modeling and uh, past uh, years of crime data to identify blocks within um, each district that are at heightened levels for armed robberies, uh, aggravated batteries, and homicides. Um, officers use Hunch Lab on their phones, so as they are driving throughout the course of um, 
a course of their day, they can I see, you know, oh, around the corner there's a hunch lab box. Uh, what is recommended is that officers spend, you know, 15 minutes three times a day um, in these boxes just to try to um, both increase their mobility so they're not just going to the same old spot that they go to every day because that's where they think they should be. Um, and also, you know, kind of open it up for questions. You know, why is this box here? Oh, it's because it's a Friday night and there's a liquor store or something uh, to kind of, you know, spur questions. Uh, gunshot detection was also rolled out in the SDSC districts. Shot Spotter is the name of the technology. Uh, what it is uh, is a set of microphones that are uh, spread out throughout the city. Um, they're very small, so you can't really identify them, but they triangulate the precise location of gunshot within the district. So instead of receiving a 911 call from you know your citizen that says, I think I hear gunshots around the block, but I'm not really sure, you know, echoes could make it sound like it's east when it's really west. Um, ShotSpotter puts a pin, you know, precisely where it is within 25 yards, so officers can respond quicker. Uh, the ShotSpotter alerts go out within 30 seconds of the actual event, whereas 911 calls typically take a few minutes, um, and it's much more precise. So it can tell you if a gunshot was fired in a backyard or an alley, um, and really allows officers to, um, to you know, react more quickly and efficiently. And then the one other piece of technology that was kind of rolled out, um, the city of Chicago did have surveillance cameras uh, before this initiative, but the innovation was that the user interface for the cameras was greatly enhanced. So previously, uh, surveillance cameras were kind of available on an Excel tree type thing, so you had to know the number of the camera, and you know you couldn't really, if a call came out on the radio, like shots fired at 1111 North Wolf, um, you didn't necessarily know like, like which camera was closest to that incident. So with the SDSCs, uh, a company called Genetech essentially overlaid the camera network onto a map, and you know whenever a call came out over the radio, uh, the alert would pop up on the map, the cameras in the proximate area would automatically become visible, and officers could quickly you know, monitor the area. Um, so those are examples of some of the technology that are included in the room. Uh, not on this slide, but what I should mention as well um, is tip submit. So the department has really enhanced its ability to collect anonymous tips. And uh, the tips that are submitted uh, by citizens are fed directly into the Strategic Decision Support Center so officers in the room can kind of react really quickly to that information. So that's kind of an overview of the technology. In terms of processes, uh, two things. So the commander's daily briefing, this is essentially a management meeting for the district commander. They come in every single day at 1 p.m. They sit at the head of the conference table. A lieutenant in the room briefs them on crime that's happened in the past 24 hours. You know, there were robberies on this block. Um, people from different law enforcement agencies, so the state's attorney's office or the FBI, ATF, narcotics will join these meetings and contribute information that they have about emerging gang conflicts um, or things to kind of like be aware of. Um, and based on this information, the commander will make decisions about where resources could be sent to kind of mitigate those, um, those events. In addition to the daily briefing, uh, a nice innovation, I think, was um, the, um, the nature of the, the analysts. So at the beginning of the year, the Chicago Police Department had um, zero civilian analysts. Um, by comparison, the New York Police Department just hired 100 additional civilian analysts, and uh, the LAPD has several hundred as well. Um, so the fact that Chicago didn't have any civilians kind of you know, supporting them in this analytical capacity was quite striking. Um, and uh, the crime lab, so myself and another one of our, uh, my colleagues, Terry Newman, uh, we were the first civilian analysts to go into the Chicago Police Department and s essentially sit along their sworn officers and work work with them to produce analysis products. We were super skeptical um, that the Chicago Police Department would welcome in a bunch of you Chicago nerds to like help them with their everyday, um, but we were really impressed and uh, quite shocked actually by the welcoming that we received. Um, as I said, uh, we had to scale up this endeavor after three weeks, so that meant we had to 
spend less time in the first two districts to kind of cover the rest. And uh, the commanders of the first two districts were not happy when we left. Um, there was a lot of like internal fighting between them to kind of see who could get the most time with us. So they really saw um, a lot of value in what we were doing. And I think just having uh, someone with you know a background in data analysis look at your information and present it in a new way, um, and then you know using that information to inform you know where your resources are going uh, was really like a game changer changer within uh, the police districts. So just to get into a few results, um, what you're seeing is a map of Chicago and then the reductions in shootings and homicides that we're seeing. So there are three different colors. The blue um, indicates District 7 and 11. Those are the districts that went live first and they kind of had the most um, care in terms of setup. So we think they are the kind of model of what should be happening in the SDSCs. So that's the blue bar. The red bar um, is uh, the value of the reductions in all the SDSC districts, so all six. And then the gray bar is um, the rest of the city, out, like excluding SDSCs. So as you can see, districts seven and 11 are experiencing the most um, dramatic reductions in shootings and homicides year to date. It's about 33%, um, and this is actually a bit outdated. The numbers are uh, larger now. Um, and the SDSCs, so all of the SDSCs are seeing about 22% reductions in both shootings and homicides. And then when you take out the SDSCs from the city of Chicago's progress, um, reductions still exist in shootings, not in homicides, um, but they're modest. So we're really encouraged by the fact that you know the SDSCs seem to be driving the reductions in, um, in gun violence that Chicago is experiencing this year. And this is obviously, you know, not necessarily like causal. So being the University of Chicago, we've taken it upon ourselves to really like identify anything else that could be driving the reductions. Um, you know, we were working with really uh, skeptical economists and they're not willing to just say like, yes, this is it. So for the past several months, we've been like pouring over the data, really trying to understand like, is there any other plausible solution that could be causing these reductions? Um, so here's our you know, very best estimate. What we've done is we've performed what we call a synthetic control evaluation. Um, because you know, we weren't able to randomize where the districts were uh, stood up, the SDSCs, uh, it's really hard for us to establish a counterfactual. Um, but what we did instead was we created uh, what we're calling a synthetic district. So uh, what that is, is let's take District 7, for example, um, as is on the slide. Uh, we are trying to identify or like construct a counterfactual for District 7 using weights from other districts. So it's essentially a composite. We're taking, um, you know, 2% of District 12 and 13% of District 15 and then kind of building the model of what District 7 would have been absent of the synthetic, uh, absent of the SDSC. So the black line represents actual shootings in District 7 and the dotted red line is our best estimate for what shootings would have been. So as you can see in the period before the gray, um, our estimate for District 7 and what actually happened is very, very good um, because those two lines track super closely together. And then if you look at the gray section of the, of the graph, what you can see is that the the lines diverge. So that is when the SDSCs went into effect um, and we calculated the, the significant difference um, to be about 35%. So the SDSCs are accounting for, um, you know, 35, um, or the SDSCs led to a 35% reduction in shootings in District 7. Um, and it's interesting to note that while the, um, the lines seem to be diverging even before the intervention, uh, that was not a significant difference. Uh, so what really happened was the SDSCs kind of um, you know, enhanced the, or kind of um, sped up the decrease and that is when it became significant. So that was a very quick overview of what we're doing in Chicago. I'm happy to answer questions in the discussion period. Uh, thank you. One question and then where we'll go behind the schedule started. Okay. All right. Can you hear me okay? All right. So I have a question. This one comes up often when we're dealing with uh, data collection uh, in applications such as these, and that has to do with bias. So we know that um, 
sources of bias might be, well, who are the users of the technology, the access to the technology? And even in your case, Kim, just the placement of sensors where they're being placed can create a bias, right? So in your respective areas, how is that, what are the implications of that bias? Uh, how is it addressed? And um, what do we need to do to kind of be better at um, addressing potential bias in data? Um, do I have an hour or two minutes? <laughs> so uh, I'll just say one thing, because this is, uh, I get this question a lot, and I can talk at length. Uh, so my strategy is always assume your data is biased and that your findings are wrong. Uh, make a list of everything you think is the reason for that, and uh, keep working on it until you've eliminated everything on that list. And then assume that there are other things you don't know about, but you've uh, built some confidence that what you found might be significant. <clears throat> In the context of Chicago, I think uh, as you know, analysts from the University of Chicago were really um, interested in the quality of the data, so garbage in, garbage out, and we don't want to perpetuate biases that may exist in the initial data collection. Um, so one of the things, just to address your shot spotter question, you know, biases in the placement of sensors, uh, while we are using um, that information to try to you know, identify where is gunfire going undetected, uh, we are also um, cross-checking it with what we're hearing from citizens and residents of those communities. So uh, our 911 calls coming in in areas where we don't have sensors, like why might that be? Um, and then we kind of go back and forth to make sure that these types of discrepancies don't persist. Uh, so it's been really encouraging to hear from the community um, that they seem to, you know, they seem to be noticing some of the things the police are doing, um, and they appreciate the change in approach. Um, but it's certainly something that we we continue to work on and be concerned about. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Okay. So th these talks also were meant sort of to stimulate some thinking for the next part. This is when now you get to work. We're going to have some uh, breakout sessions where we have an opportunity to um, examine in this first set of breakouts uh, available evidence on strategies to address. Uh, there, there are three breakouts. The community, community and youth violence is going to be based here in this room, and we'll sort of center ourselves closer in this part of the room. Um, I th on the back of your badge, you have numbers. Actually, that's what I was supposed to say, right? Um, number number one your, uh, is for community violence. Number two is intimate partner and gender-based violence. And three is suicide. So the uh, intimate partner and gender-based violence and suicides are both on the fourth floor. Uh, uh, there are going to be people in the back of the room who will escort you there. So it's uh, W4013 for intimate partner and W4019 for suicide. We'll take a short break for people to uh, do whatever they need to do and then we're gonna uh, get to work on in our breakouts. <laughs>